RethinkDB is an open source database for the real time web. Slava Akmachet is the CEO of RethinkDB. Slava, what is RethinkDB? Well, RethinkDB is an open source distributed database designed、um, from the ground up for the real time web and real time applications. And the idea is that You know, we, when we started the company, we noticed that the world is really moving towards real time. People build much more collaborative experiences.、Uh, for example, applications like Slack or Google Docs,、uh, where people collaborate、um, online. And you know, when someone makes a change to anything, it's really important for, for other participants to see it right away. And we noticed that the database architecture really wasn't written for this. So people make You know, developers they make all kinds,、uh, all kinds of really complicated decisions to build these apps. And we thought, hey, this could be dramatically easier.、Um, you know, let's build a product that makes building these kinds of apps much, much easier to do because that's where the world is going. And, and that's how we started Rethink, and that's, that's what it's for. At a slightly lower level, what problems does RethinkDB solve? At a lower level,、um, The, the problem is so imagine, you know, let's talk about the example of Google Docs. You have a document that the, one user is modifying, and you have another document that someone else is looking at. So, what you have to do is whenever a modification in, document, you know, in browser A happens, you have to store it somewhere and then push it back to browser B. So, there's been tremendous innovation on the front end with things like, you know, WebSockets and Socket.io and all kinds of client libraries to make that possible. But on the back end, it's still really hard because when you're working with a database, you typically, you know, you just,、um, the way you query data is you send a query, you get a response. If you, want, if you want new data, you have to send another query and get another response. So, on a very simple level, like if you just to write, if you were to write this application in, in a naive way, what you do is you'd start querying the database over and over again in a loop, let's say every few milliseconds. And... Of course, that turns out to be a really bad user experience because the latency is too high. You know, you can't send a query every few milliseconds. So people typically set it to seconds.、Um, and the second problem with this is if you have a lot of concurrent users and you start querying the database in a loop, you just bring down the database, right? So it's really hard to do this naively.、Um, and then you can, you know, we can talk a little bit about how people build these applications today. But on a lower level, what we think EB does is the developer can say, Instead of just sending a query, they can say, okay, I'm subscribing to this information. For example, I'm subscribing to all, anything that happens in this document. And when someone writes to the database, the database sends notifications to all the subscribers saying, hey, this particular piece of data you were interested in is different now, it's changed. And this is done via a push message. So if you're building your, your collaborative application, You know, each client can just say, okay, I'm interested in this, in this specific、uh, piece of data or these multiple specific pieces of data. And then anytime any client does anything, any modification,、um, you know, we push a message and,、um, and you can get it. And anybody who's interested in it can get it. So what that does is it makes it dramatically, so first of all, it solves the problem of bugging down the database.、Um, so it's very scalable because the database knows at all times what happens. Um, and it can efficiently push these messages. And it solves the problem of your infrastructure getting much more complicated because you can't do it in a naive way typically. So, the way people do it now is you know, it's pretty hard. You have to add a lot of different pieces. And we take all of that complexity out. So, the code becomes much simpler,、um, the infrastructure becomes much simpler. You don't have to add a lot of, a lot of different moving pieces. And the way we do that is by pushing these messages about data updates. Does that make sense, Jeff? Yes, the push notification, and、we'll, we will get into that.、Um, but what differentiates Rethink from other databases on the market? What are the most specific points of differentiation? So, the biggest piece of differentiation is RethinkDB is completely designed around push architecture. So,、um, you know, anything that happens in the database, we can push a message up to the user. And, and I brought up a specific example. Of you know, the user's interested in this piece of data. But it's not just data, it's done for computations too. So, for example, you could say, you know, I'm interested in the top 10 selling products in my store. And then anytime something happens, the database will recompute this. So, it isn't just looking at a specific document in the database, it's looking at a, at a computation. And at the core of everything, you'd be there is a computation engine、um, that's designed for, for push notifications. And,、um, 
you know, whenever something changes, we recompute things efficiently, push the message. And what that does is it makes building real-time uh, real apps dramatically easier. It's the main piece of differentiation in RethinkDB. And, you know, there's a lot of other things. Like, we cared a lot about both the developers and operations people. So, so the query language is extremely convenient. It's very nice. Um, RethinkDB is much, much easier to scale than a lot of competing systems. It's really designed with ops people in mind. The guarantees that we offer are typically much more... Um, they're, they're much more significant than, than what you'd get with a lot of database systems. So there's actually a lot in the internals that differentiates and rethink you be when it comes to small technical details. But on a high level, um, the push architecture is extremely important. I think it's one of the first databases um, in the world to do this. We will get into the engineering uh, that underlies that push architecture. But first, how did rethink DB originate? What is the origin story? Um, the origin story, so my background, um, I grew up in New York City, and I was, you know, I'm a software engineer. I was working on, on Wall Street in the financial industry, and I was responsible, actually, for building um, custom databases for some of the high-frequency trading use cases we had, and nothing off the shelf, you know, would do. So, um, so I worked there for a while. I learned a lot, but I didn't really like the environment. I went to grad school. And in grad school, I was studying uh, brain simulation on supercomputers. So I learned a lot about clustering. I learned a lot about distributed systems. And in the meantime, I met my co-founder, Michael, who was, um, uh, you know, he was mainly doing a lot of web development, web, web applications, computer, human-computer interaction, stuff like that. And we met, we started talking, and I told him, you know, I told him about what I was doing. And he said, hey, you know, this is a huge problem on the web. And you seem to know a lot about it. And we just started brainstorming ideas. We noticed that the way people build and deploy web applications is changing. And these changes are going to percolate through the whole development stack. So we decided to start a company. And this, so this was back on the East Coast in New York. Um, in New York. And we kind of packed our bags and moved to California and incorporated and, you know, just never looked back. RethinkDB supports a push model, as you mentioned rather than the request handling model. Could you give a broader explanation of how that compares to application development of the past that's based on request response? Yes, so I talked a little bit about how if you use request response, um, you have to, you know, you have to continuously query the database, which is really hard because you end up bringing it down. It's hard to scale and the latency turns out to be pretty bad. And if you think about it, if you squint your eyes for a bit, the reason why request response model used to work for databases on the web for so long is because HTTP was request response, right? So you send a request, you know, the browser sends an HTTP request to the web server, the web server sends a request to the database, gets the response, sends the response. But now that we have web sockets um, and the web server often has to push data to the browser, the the top of the stack is no longer request response. It's much more complicated, right? And what people try to do is they try to shoehorn this request response database model on top of a much completely different model for building web applications. So that's why push, push is very important. And I mentioned a naive way of doing it where you just query the database over and over again. And, you know, that clearly people learn very quickly that that doesn't work. So then what they start doing later is they start, they figure out, okay, this doesn't work, we have to optimize it. And there's a couple of ways of doing it, um, you know, but generally when you start doing that, your code becomes much more complicated because um, you have to split, you, you have to split your code. You have to write to the database and then push a message somewhere else. And then you have to have a piece of infrastructure for keeping track of all these messages. You have to have code to route these messages among, you know, among your clients. And if you have multiple web servers, if you're scaling your web servers, then the web servers have to talk to each other. Um, they have to filter out the messages so you don't saturate your network. You have to do all these things, and it's really, really hard. Um, and, you know, the experts in the space can definitely do it. it. It's clearly doable, but it's really hard. And Rethink makes it really, really easy because you just use your database directly, and it's designed to handle all of that complexity. So, so the software engineer kind of pushes it on, you know, pushes the burden into everything to be, and they don't have to worry about that stuff. Does that make sense, Jeff? Absolutely. So many applications build push in the application layer on top of a database. 
Why is it better to have that layer within the database itself? There are a couple of reasons. Um, so the first reason is the database, the database itself has a lot of knowledge um, that the application doesn't have. So one canonical example of this is suppose, suppose you're trying to get you know, top 10 players in your game in real time. You can build and you, you want to push that leaderboard to the clients in real time, show it to people in real time. So the, you can do this in the application, but it's really, really hard because if you, for example, learn um, that your number 10 player drops out, it's very hard for you to know what the next, the next player is because the application just doesn't have that data. So it would have to send the query to the database and get it, and it would have to know which user to get. So it, it's quite challenging to do in the application. It's actually doable. Uh, I mean, people have definitely done it before, but you have to deal with a lot of custom code. So for each interaction you want to implement, you have to write a lot of custom code to deal with it. Um, you have to deal with routing, and you have to add a message bus, um, you know, if you ever want to scale, and you have to write routing code above that message bus. So you have to do all these things, and a lot of it becomes custom work. And, you know, in software engineering, we talk a lot about abstractions, and we talk about the fact that if the abstractions are right, then everything is easy and everything kind of flows. And if the abstractions are wrong, then everything becomes really, really complicated. And doing data manipulation in the application like that is kind of the wrong abstraction because um, the application just doesn't have that information. It's all custom code. And you could do this much, much more elegantly in the database that's both more efficient and results in a dramatically simpler um, application code. What is the full stack architecture when the database is pushing rather than pulling? Okay, so people do this in different ways. Um, usually, rethink DB users, they tend to use Node.js. Sometimes they use Ruby or Python. Um, sometimes other languages like C Sharp or the JVM stack. But generally, um, and you know, sometimes it's not always the browser, sometimes it's the mobile phone, so it's kind of hard to generalize, but, but I'll try. So generally what happens is you have your web browser, you have your web client, and it's communicating with the web server via some kind of a socket protocol. So web sockets, typically people use socket.io, you could use different libraries. Um, so on the front end, it's usually a framework like React or Angular. Then there's a WebSocket connection to the web server, and the web server is usually Node.js or, or Python or Ruby. And then that communicates with the database via the RethinkDB drivers. So that would be the stack, the real-time stack, if you use RethinkDB. And if you didn't use RethinkDB, you'd need, the stack would be much more complicated because you'd need a database, you'd need a message bus, um, you'd need a lot of um, custom code in the application to push messages on the message bus and to read from the message bus. And people often add a lot of other custom code to hook into the database to kind of get updates and do computations. You've mentioned messaging a couple times now. Push is usually handled in a messaging layer that is responsible for durability and delivery guarantees and other features. Is Rethink really a database with a messaging layer bundled in? Okay, so I think as, thinking about it as a database with a message messaging layer bundled in is kind of a good first approximation. If you think about it that way, you'll probably be right um, quite a bit about what RethinkDB can do for people. But it's not really designed with a message bus in mind. So message buses are very different. They have different purposes. You know, as you mentioned, Jeff, they guarantee delivery. They have a lot of different features. They have pop up features. Rethink does this a little bit differently. What we do is, instead of thinking about everything as messages, we think about it as changes in the data. So, for example, if you're building a web application and you want to show, you want to re-render your DOM every five milliseconds um, and show new data every five milliseconds, because if you do it faster than that, the user doesn't care, right? It, it doesn't matter. They can't see changes faster than that. So what we think you will do, it has a feature called squash, which will squash updates. So if multiple things, if multiple relevant changes happen within a five millisecond period, then RethinkDB, instead of sending multiple messages to the clients that saying, hey, stuff keeps changing, it will wait five milliseconds and then um, send a single message saying, here's the changes to the data. 
And if the changes um, intercept, then it will figure all of that out, and it will send you the latest, you know, the latest relevant piece of information. So, for web developers, you actually want that. And of course, all of that is configurable, and people can turn it off and change that. But it's much more, um, it's much better to think of it as differences in data um, that we inform people about instead of messages, because the use cases are different. And there are some things we think we can't do right now. Um, you know, like the, the traditional message process will do. So if you need guaranteed delivery and you need to make sure every message um, that, that you push on a bus you see, like RethinkUB is not the best product for that. There's much, much better solutions. Um, what we do is uh, we just make sure you get the latest piece of data you're, you're, you're interested in. It, it's, so it's not about messages. It's about differences in data. Um, does that make sense, Jeff? Yes, does Rethink support PubSub? Is there like a PubSub API somewhere? So a couple of people have built a PubSub system on top of RethinkDB change feeds, and it's actually pretty easy. There is some code. Um, if you go to RethinkDB.com slash docs, I think we have an example of how to build a PubSub system. Um, so it's very easy to build on top of feeds, but we don't, you know, we don't ship that natively. It's not part of the product. Real-time is a buzzword that gets used a lot how does Rethink define a real-time application? We define a real-time application as um, basically an application when multiple users generally collaborate and they need to see the changes made by one user. All the, you know, the other users need to see it within a very short period of time, probably under, you know, under whatever's, whatever's possible in HTTP, let's say under 20 milliseconds. Um, although... There are some applications where the requirements are stricter and you have to get to, you know, five milliseconds or so. Um, when you have those more strict requirements, does the usage of Rethink uh, change or does, does Rethink tend to just provide uh, that latency and, and the bottleneck is more on the application developer? No, the usage doesn't change. It's pretty much the same. So for our change feeds, um, our, the users can say, which timeline they expect, and you'd be surprised. Sometimes you want it to be a little bit higher, like if you're rendering DOM and there's a lot of stuff going on, like let's say you're updating market data, you know, about stocks, and you have this pipe and it's changing very quickly. You don't want to re-render the DOM more than, let's say, every 20 milliseconds, because if you do that, the experience on the browser becomes bad. So all the user has to say is, I care about updates within this bound of time, and then we'll bundle them, uh, we'll dedupe them, we'll do all the work and, and send that information to the user. And the use is it's exactly the same. You've mentioned the word change feed a couple times. What is the definition of a change feed? A change feed is a query in RethinkDB, just like any other query, except you tell Rethink, like, hey, when you send me the response, don't stop. Keep sending me updates when something changes. So it's basically, one way to think about it is a cursor. It's like a cursor that never terminates. Um, so you open this cursor, and then whenever there's updates to the result set, the user gets these updates. What is the data model of RethinkDB? RethinkDB is a document store. Um, more specifically, it's a JSON store. So what you store in the database, it's usually JSON documents. Um, and it's extended a little bit, so you could store you know, geospatial data, geojson, uh, binary data, we extend JSON to deal with time a little bit better, and of course it's all backwards compatible, so you could get JSON out. Um, so it, it's definitely a document model, and then you can build relationships on top of that um, and do joins, which is a huge deal. We think is one of the only, I think, NoSQL products that supports distributed join, um, join queries. Um, so it's, it's a document model, but you could also model relationships very effectively. What about the transaction model? If I update the database and as a result some pushes occur to my application, at what point is the transaction considered complete? So the push um, the push model in RethinkDB is asynchronous with respect to the writes. So when you do a write, there's a lot of guarantees that have to happen in a distributed database, you know, to make sure all the nodes, all the relevant nodes got the write and so on. Then the, the client gets the acknowledgement whenever the data is safely committed to disk. Um, the push notification happens, happens asynchronously. We send it to, you know, to all the relevant clients that are interested in it. And what the clients can do is there's some provisions, and we're extending that quite a bit actually, to correlate the write 
um, the write that happened to the message that happened. So you can, for example, tell, okay, like, you know, I've received this message that means all of these, that means I've received the messages relevant to all of the writes, you know, like this one and before that. So we do a lot of that, but there is no transaction uh, with respect to push and messages because this doesn't really work well um, on the web. What about the consistency model? Um, so RethinkUB is immediately consistent. Uh, when you do a write, you get um, get the response notification. You read it. You you generally you always get um, you know you can always see the write um, that you made. Um, and with respect to a single document, you get all of the consistency and durability guarantees that you would expect of a relational database. We're very, very serious about that stuff. Um, so, you know, we're very serious about people's data. And um, you get, you pretty much get all the guarantees that you get in a relational database, but only as long as you're looking at a single document, not a cross document. Is RethinkDB distributed or monolithic? Uh, you mean with respect to, like, the network? Uh, in in terms of how people tend to implement it, if you how pe- how people tend to use it. Oh, it's definitely distributed. So people typically start with a single, you know, they download everything to be typically on their laptop. Um, so you develop, you can develop on one node, and then when you need to scale, people generally build out clusters and they move up to three nodes, then five, and then they keep going up. So it's definitely distributed. So once they distribute. What kind of cap trade-offs does RethinkDB make? Okay, so RethinkDB is hugely biased towards consistency. Um, if you have, so if you have a cluster or mul- even multiple data centers um, with a lot of machines, and then you have a split brain scenario, you can only write on one side of the split brain. Um, that's guaranteed. You can read consistent data on, on one side of the split brain. On the other side, you could read outdated data, but not by default. So you have to pass a flag saying, I'm okay with outdated data. So whenever there is a partitioning scenario, uh, we very highly, we're very highly biased towards consistency than availability. And the reason we do that is because it makes building applications much simpler because you don't, the application developer doesn't have to deal with conflicts. Um, it just results in a dramatically better developer experience environment. So we tell people who need availability in the face of partitioning, network partitioning, we told them to use other products. And there's really good products for that. They're typically much harder to program against, uh, but they solve that problem much better. What are the invariants that RethinkDB provides? Um, Okay, so this is a little hard because Rethink is a big product. Um, But I'd say the biggest invariant is, is if you write the data and you get the acknowledgement, um, you can be sure that the data is on disk and you're going to be able to get it later. Um, if you make multiple changes to a document, those changes are atomic. So, you know, they're in a single document, they're either both going to get written or neither of them are going to get written. You know, if the power goes out, um, it's not going to corrupt your system. So it's, it's all of the traditional kind of asset guarantees that you get in a regular database. These are invariants in RethinkDB, except in RethinkDB, it's only true with respect to a single document, whereas in a relational database, you could do it across multiple rows um, and get transactions across rows, which isn't possible in Rethink. Is there a scenario where RethinkDB can see stale data? Um, Yes. So this is actually extremely rare, but there are situations where if you have a multi-node cluster and you have what we call cascading split brain scenarios, so it's not just one failure in the network, um, it's multiple kind of cascading failures and um, you know some of the nodes fail while some other stuff happens, um, there is a possibility of stale data. So this is very rare and multiple things have to go wrong, but it's possible and we actually have modes and rethink to deal with that stuff so the user can specify okay, I'm okay with seeing stale data, but get high-performance reads um, in these rare situations, or I don't want to see stale data. I always want consistent consistent views, uh, but the reads are a little bit slower. So we let the user control all of the behavior and kind of trade off performance and consistency. Could you talk more about how RethinkDB handles write durability? 
Yeah, so I mentioned a couple of times that you know we care very deeply about people's data because it's obviously at the core of everything, and you get the same the same guarantees for write durability that you'd get in the you know in a traditional relational database. But on on a lower level, what happens when the user does a write is so let's say it's a distributed scenario, and you have you know three replicas, which means you you've asked the database to maintain three copies of your data. So what happens when a client does a write is um, RethinkDB will send that write to three different nodes um, in the cluster, and it will wait for the majority of the nodes to acknowledge the write. When the majority of the nodes acknowledge that write, the Rethink, RethinkDB sends acknowledgement to the client. So then, if anything fails, um, you have majority. Um, you have majority of the nodes contain new data, and we timestamp everything and stuff like that. So if an, if one of the nodes fails and then restarts, it will contact contact all the relevant nodes, um, ask for the latest updates, and and figure all of that stuff out. So um, so that's how writes are handled on the in the distributed layer, and then on disk, uh, we have a storage engine that you know that deals with it pretty much in a similar way as as any other traditional database would. There's a couple of differences, but I don't know if we have time um, to go into that. Does that make sense, Jeff? Absolutely. Um, do, do you agree with? The, I mean, you've you've mentioned a couple times that there are scenarios where you need uh, a different uh, store than than rethink. Do you agree with the premise of polyglot persistence that applications generally need a variety of databases with varying sets of features and guarantees? So I don't know how I feel about it ideologically, but empirically, we always see that in our user stacks. That's exactly um, what the MemSQL CTO said. <laughs> really? I didn't know that. I didn't listen to that podcast. But yeah, I mean, it shows up. It's not just Rethink, though. It's People use three, four, five different systems um, to do what they need. And sometimes in really big organizations, we, what we see is they have a um, they have a single store, for example, HBase, where they store all their, all their data. And then for custom use cases, they take slices of data from HBase that are relevant to that use case and put it in a completely different product. And in a big organization, I mean, they can have dozens and dozens of, of different products and hundreds of instances across teams. So, yeah, I'd say I agree with, with polyglot persistence. You, you're saying you agree with it empirically, though. So what is, I mean, is there some bright future where developers only need one database product that does everything for them? Um, oh, man, ideologically, I think it's very, very hard because... The use cases are really diverging um, for people. People are doing a lot of very, very different things. And it's just, you know, this diversity hasn't been around here in the 90s. Like in the 90s, all of the things that we did were the same. And now um, there's just much more stuff that happens in a typical infrastructure. So I honestly, you know, I look at a lot of products like um, we're very proud of what we've done with Rethink. And we think it's amazing. It's an amazing product for the use of cases that we've built it for, built it for. But I also look at a lot of other things people are doing, and I'm, you know, they're very, very impressive. And are so, for example, Elasticsearch is just phenomenal for what it does. Um, and I don't see, you know, I don't see how they could do what we do, and I don't see how we could do what they do well in a single product. So I think the web and storage is probably going to move closer to the Unix philosophy, where. It's not quiet, you know, do one thing and do it well, but it's do a small set of things that are relevant to each other and do that well. So in the polyglot reality that we live in, how does RethinkDB operate alongside other databases? What role should it play in a polyglot architecture? So RethinkDB integrates with a lot of other database systems really nicely. And in particular, change feeds make that... um, make that really, really easy, and there's some libraries that have been written in the community to integrate RethinkDB with pretty much any database in existence. Um, we tell people to use Rethink um, for this real-time use case. It's very often the authoritative um, source of data. Um, I can tell you a little bit about what happens in the wild, you know, in real deployments. So people will very often use Elasticsearch uh, for some of the full-text search functionality. Um, they'll use sometimes message bosses to integrate with with other applications that use relational systems. Relational systems are typically there for financial processing 
uh, where transactions across multiple documents are important. So that's generally how it tends to work out. Interesting. RethinkDB is written entirely in C++. This might be kind of a naive question, but why did you choose C++? We chose C++ because performance uh, was very important. And there were a couple of, like, if you look at the options, I think there were a couple of um, options we could have picked. And probably on the top of the list was C and C++. So we chose C++ instead of C because it gave us greater flexibility to deal with kind of bigger architectures. And a lot of the early people that started rethink to be new C++, you know, really well. So it was a natural, natural choice. Um, right now, there's, there's more options. There is Go. Um, I hear Rust is, is um, developing pretty nicely, and I really like that language. Um, so Go has, still has some garbage collection issues that are you know, probably good enough for most, most applications, but not databases. And Rust doesn't have GC in the same way, but it, it, you know, a lot of that stuff is still being developed. So I think for a low-level infrastructure software like this, where latency is really important and performance really important, I mean, no, there's been a lot of development, but C++ is still, to this day, probably the best language. Um, and probably will stay that way for a while. Do you have much insight into what the things that Go or Rust need to overcome in order to be resilient and flexible enough as languages to have databases written in them? Yeah, so I actually, I love programming languages. I'm kind of a PL nerd. Um, and if you look at Rethink Big Query Language, you'll see that it was designed by a lot of people who, who hopefully understand programming languages really well. Um, so I, I think about that a lot. I think with Go, um, there is, it's just fundamentally there is a garbage collector. And they keep, you know, they keep doing updates and it keeps getting better and better. But um, for a database, garbage collectors are really bad because that means there are stalls and you can get a variance in the latency um, you know, for queries. And that's really, really bad um, for a database product. So for Go, I don't think it will ever be a good systems language for the kinds of products like databases just because the garbage collector is baked in. Like the moment you get a garbage collector, even if it's really, really good, and even that takes, you know, decades, um, getting that to be a good language for system projects like databases is really hard. For Rust, um, I think Rust is a lot more promising because it's designed for more lower-level lower use cases. It's just a new language. Um, you know, it's going to take some time to develop. People have to learn it. They have to learn best practices. And, you know, it's easy to learn a language. It's much harder to learn um, all of the all of the icebergs that you're going to hit in production when you're um, architecting your application. So, so, yeah, I think Rust is a lot is a lot more promising. It's just new. So, since you're saying that you don't need garbage collection or you don't want garbage collection when you're writing a database, um, to to application developers who are listening to this, who who all of the the work that they've done has been in uh, garbage collection-based languages, they probably understand that garbage collection is this hazard. Uh, it, it can slow you down. It, it does have problems. But how does your, like, what is the paradigm shift you need to make when you are writing an application that does not necessitate garbage collection like RethinkDB? Okay, so... So the problem was so garbage collection is wonderful, of course, and the problem with garbage collection is latency. So if the GC kicks in, um, it's going to stall. It's going to stall your thread. Um, hopefully, only a single thread. And then when a query comes in, that stall is going to be visible um, in the latency that the user is going to see. So you can't do that, right? That's that's very very important. Um, it's very important in the database to have as little latency variance as possible. If you don't use garbage collection, for example, if you use C++, then you're really switching to a whole slew of other techniques. And so some of the, the, best, you know, the best thing you can do is you can know really well um, the, the lifetime of all your objects. And if you can tell the lifetime of your objects, you could just do manual memory management and you can um, you know, deallocate memory when it makes sense. And it works really well, for example, with short queries, because if I do a short query... I know when it begins and I know when it ends, and I can just deallocate all the objects at the end of the query. So that you know that's extremely fast. Um, it's very efficient. It works really well. 
Um, you know, and you don't need garbage collection. You don't have to deal with latency issues. If you have longer queries, of course, things get more complicated because you might need to deallocate memory in the middle. And there's all kinds of ways of doing it. You could use shared pointers. You could, um, you know, use scope pointers. And shared pointers are really cool, except you can't have, you know, cycles. So you have to design your code in a certain way. So you're really, you're going down a, a rabbit hole if you're not using garbage collection. It's, it's a whole other thing. Speaking of rabbit holes we can go down, RethinkDB is written in C++, but drivers exist for Ruby and Python and JavaScript and other languages. Could you describe the functions of a database driver and how a database driver interacts with a C++ database application? Yes, so the function of a RethinkDB driver, um, it's, it's interesting because it was very important for us to give people a query language that doesn't feel like they don't have to manipulate strings, right? It should feel like an API, like a library. So when you're querying RethinkDB in Python, it feels like you're just writing Python code. If you're querying it in Ruby, it feels like you're writing Ruby code and so on. So what the driver does is it's really a thin layer that integrates extremely well into the development environment that you're used to. So it feels like you're writing in the language um, you know, that, that you're writing in. Um, that's the function of a RethinkDB driver, to provide people with the best possible user experience to query the database. Now, the way the driver communicates with RethinkDB is we have a wire protocol, and it's public, you know, it's on RethinkDB.com slash docs. Anybody could write a, write, a driver um, that interacts with this wire protocol, and, and it will work with the server. The wire protocol is, it's, you know, it's, it's, for TCP, so it starts out as binary, but it's basically JSON. Um, so you could, you know, you just send JSON on the wire, the database interprets it and, and sends back a response. And it's very efficient, it's very fast, um, it's, and it's relatively easy to implement. So, so that's why, actually, there's been so many community-developed drivers. So we've dived down deep. I'd like to zoom out again. How does a developer get started with RethinkDB? Well, the easiest way is to go to RethinkDB.com and kind of read a little bit about um, what it does for you. And if it makes sense, um, you can download it very easily. It's available on OSX right now via Brew or, or you know, Package Manager, DMG. Um, it's also available in pretty much all flavors of Linux. We're currently working on a Windows port um, that's going to be available pretty soon. But you could also do it in Docker. Uh, you could deploy it in the cloud. You could use um, Compose.io, which is uh, one of our partners that, that will let you deploy everything in the cloud. And a lot of people actually use them just to get everything to be server for development. You know, so there's many, many ways to, um, to just install it. It's really simple. It only takes a few seconds. And then we have really good documentation, and we have a lot of tutorials on RethinkDB.com. And a lot of people in the community have, have built a lot of tutorials. So I'd get started that way. I'd go through our guide. It's, it's, it's quite simple. And then if you have a specific stack, like, for example, let's say you use AngularJS, um, there's some specific tutorials for how to get started with your thing to be in Angular, for example. And, you know, some, the same thing for, for other frameworks. Is there a notable developer experience difference between a user on a Rails stack versus an Angular or a Spring stack? Um, a rail, Yeah, so... Well, see, we're kind of jumping a little bit because Angular is a front-end framework and Rails... Sure, okay, ExpressJS oh. stack or a mean stack. Um, yeah, so so generally the user experience is really nice in Node.js because Node.js is an asynchronous language, um, right? So it works much, much better uh, with change feeds. Uh, if you use Ruby or Python... If you're just using RethinkDB without change feeds, it's pretty similar to using any other database, and it's really nice. If you start using change feeds in, in Ruby and Python and other languages like that that don't have asynchronous behavior built in, you have to use some of the libraries like Twisted or Event Machine um, so or you know, Async.io in Python. There's a lot of options. So, yeah, there's a little bit of difference, a little bit of differences in each, in each stack. Um, but generally, it's very, very similar. Like the drivers look almost exactly the same. So if you have a Python, Python RethinkDB code and you look at it, you can convert it to Ruby very trivially. So Meteor is a JavaScript application framework for building real-time apps uh, that leverages Node.js. Uh, and it seems to me that Meteor would have a lot of synergies with RethinkDB. 
Um, but uh, maybe I'm off base here. Is, is that accurate, or do, do you know much about Meteor? Oh, that's totally accurate. So we actually know the team, and when we were designing change feeds, um, the first thing we did is we met with the Meteor team, and we said, hey, guys, you know, what do you see um, in, in the wild? What, what are the important use cases for your users? So we kind of collaborated with them to design, design the, the, the feeds um, in everything to be when it comes to the API. And architecturally, all of that happened a lot earlier, but, but the API and, and the user-facing stuff was done in conjunction with the Meteor team. And um, some people have done an integration with everything to be in Meteor. There's still a little bit more work that needs to happen um, before it's production grade, but people can probably start building apps on top of it now. So yeah, there's, we definitely. I think what Meteor has done is all of that complexity, they've baked it into the Meteor framework and took it away from, from application developers. Uh, but because they're dealing with database systems, it's hard to scale. For example, Meteor doesn't work with like sharded, um, sharded databases right now. So yeah, it's, it's very close. We work pretty closely with them, and they've been immensely helpful in providing information about what needs to happen um, you know, in the database layer. To, to have a phenomenal user experience for the application developer. Is Meteor a leading indicator for how application development is going to be done in the future? Um, I think there is a lot of innovation going on um, in application development, and people are trying. So the world has clearly changed. Like The kinds of apps we're building is totally different. And people are trying a lot of different ideas. So if you look at paradigms, you know, Angular does it one way. Uh, Facebook's React does it a different way. Meteor does it a third way. I think it's very hard to tell um, which way it's going to go, but it's, I think it's pretty clear to everyone that it's, it's going to change. It's already changed. What is ReQL? ReQL is a rethink to be query language, and it's a query language we designed um, with a couple of um, important design goals. So one is we wanted people to have a really, really good um, experience um, developing in their native language. So if you know, you're writing Python, requel code looks just like Python code, for example. Um, the second thing we wanted is we wanted it to be very efficient. So when you write a requel query and you send it, um, send it to the cluster, it all executes in the cluster. The cluster figures out where to send it, how, you know, how to get the data, how to do all that stuff, and you just get a response. Um, so requel is really, really wonderful to use. And again, if you go to everythingdb.com slash docs, um, you can learn a lot about how it works, why it works, and how easy it is to get started. What does it mean to have chainable queries? Chainable queries is for for listeners who've used jQuery before. You're already used to this um, to this idea. The idea, or actually, for listeners who've used Bash Bash before um, on the command line, you've or also or currying, right? Just currying and programming. Or languages. currying. Yeah, so this this idea actually shows up um, in a lot of different in a lot of different cases, but generally in rethink. So imagine you know you have your table that has a bunch of documents. Let's say you have a table of users that that stores the user data. Then what you can do is you can chain a command on top of that. So let's say you wanted to join it with an organization they work with. So you say table users dot join you know company, and then after that, let's say you wanted to pull out only the fields you wanted to. So you say dot pluck. Um, you know, user company. And then, so you can keep doing this. You can keep adding commands, and then the data flows from left to right. So it's sort of like pipe in bash or like dot um, in jQuery. And you can basically manipulate data in very, very sophisticated ways. But to a user, it feels extremely natural because you're just building up this query from left to right. And anytime you get more data or less data, if, if you narrow it, you figure out, okay, here's the next thing I'm going to do. So it's an extremely intuitive way to building very complicated data queries that, that you couldn't really do so intuitively in something like SQL, for example. To emphasize this, could you explain what happens when I write a series of chained queries? Maybe you could give an example. And then you call run on the query chain. Explain it in a little more detail what happens. Yeah, so let's say I say table users dot join, you know, company dot pluck username company name um, dot run. So what I've done there is I took all the data from my users table, I've joined it with my company table. I only pulled out username and company name, 
Um, and then I type dot run and pass it a connection, which means okay, it's time to run, you know, the run to, to run the query. So what happens is the driver will take this whole query, the whole thing. So not just the first piece, then the second piece. It will take the whole thing, package it up in the JSON um, wire protocol, and send it to the cluster. So the whole thing gets executed in the database server. Nothing happens on the client. The database server will get the query. And the data could be on one node, or if you're sharded or replicated, it could be on multiple nodes. Um, and so the database will get this query. It will figure out where all of the data is. Um, it will send the relevant messages inside the cluster, do the computations, get the data back, and then send it to the user. So from a user's point of view, you don't have to care if it's distributed or not. Um, you, just, you, know, you just write your query, everything gets executed on the, on, the ser on the server, on the cluster. And it can actually get really complex. Like you could do MapReduce, you could do aggregations, you could do computations, you could do a ton of different stuff, and all of that is handled by the database server. RethinkDB is in production at hundreds of startups and consulting studios and Fortune 500 companies. Could you give an example about how a user from one of these companies is taking advantage of RethinkDB? Yeah, so one example we give is Jive Software. Um, so Jive Software, it's a public company. They've built a product called Jive Chime, and it's basically it's a messaging product for, for their users. Um, it's similar to Slack or HipChat, if people have used that before, it, it, but it's designed for you know, Jive, um, Jive toolchain um, or Jive suite, suite of products. So messaging is, is an example that comes up a lot. We have a lot of really interesting users in a lot of different verticals. Some of, one of my favorite ones is a company called Simune that does gaming, um, in particular multiplayer, multiplayer gaming, and, and they use RethinkDB quite a bit. We're actually working right now on uh, video case studies with a lot of our customers that we'll be publishing pretty soon. And what we do is we go out, we interview some of the folks there, and we ask them, hey, what do you like about the product? What do you not like it? You know, how did it work out for you? What's the use case? So we'll be publishing video series pretty soon, and I'm very excited about it because there's some really cool use cases of everything to be that I can't wait to tell people about. Can you give any previews on that? Like, what are the commonalities between what people say they really like about Rethink? So the common things people say is they really like the push model because it makes their lives dramatically easier when they build the application. Um, they really like the flexibility of the query language. Um, the fact that you could do joins and how easy it is to write. And they really like the fact that when you deploy everything to be and you need to scale it, um, the operational story is actually really, really good. Um, so operations people love the product because they, don't, they no longer have to you know, wake up in the middle of the night um, to deal with, with problems. So these are generally three things people, people say. Um, I can't talk about specifics, though. I don't, I'd have to coordinate it with some people here. But yeah, I'm very excited, um, and we're going to publish a lot of that stuff really soon. Could you talk any more about the uh, how, like <clears throat> how you would make a messaging application using Rethink, or like what are the things that you don't have to do be because you have Rethink? Um, or you could talk about games, uh, or maybe the commonalities between those two verticals. Yeah, so messaging. Um, well, and even games. So in case of games, if you have a multiplayer game and let's say you have a character in a specific location in the game and lots of other players around them, and then that character moves, let's say, in a strategy game, you need everyone else to find that out. Um, so you need to push that notification to all, of the, all the other players. In messaging, whenever someone says something, you need to send a message to everyone who's interested. So for example, you know, in Slack, there are channels, and if someone says something in the channel, anybody who's subscribed to the channel needs to see um, needs to see the message. So that's kind of the commonality: is the fact that you're pushing pushing data. So if you were to do this um, the naive way, you'd have to query the database all the time to get the messages. And we talked about how that doesn't work. Um, so what people start doing is they start editing they start adding pieces of infrastructure like PubSub, and then anytime someone um, sends a message. What they do is they, they split the code base. So the first part of the code says, okay, write this to the database because I might need this later. The second part of the code says push it on a message bus. And then there's a separate piece of code that has to maintain all of the channels and all of that information. You typically also store that in the database. And then whenever someone joins a channel, leaves a channel, you have to configure your message bus to account for all that stuff. 
So that's the kind of code you'd have to write. And then in the UI and the web servers, you'd have to write a lot of code to propagate that back um, you know, to the user. Uh, which we think you don't need the message bus. Um, you don't need to write any of that routing code. You just say, so when someone, you don't have to split your code. So when someone, you know, sends a message, um, you just write it to the database. And on the receiving end, you say, you know, this logged in user cares about these channels. And then anytime someone writes to those channels, the, the, um, the part of the code that deals with that user is just going to get a message saying, hey, here's messages in all the channels this particular user cares about. Um, so that, that becomes much, much simpler. We talked about this some at the beginning, but I want to ask again after we've delved into the technical details, what is the key breakthrough? What are the breakthroughs of RethinkDB? What is being rethought? So we started with um, kind of throwing out all of the assumptions um, about database systems and starting from scratch. And what we learned after a long time of doing this is that, and we kind of suspected, you know, suspected a lot of this would happen, but um, so when you're dealing with disk and you're dealing with queries and you're dealing with all of the traditional like database storage stuff, the systems that were designed, you know, 20, 30 years ago are absolutely rock solid and you want a lot of that, you don't want to rethink any of that stuff. Like when you're storing data, um, you know, we've solved those problems those solutions are really, really good. You don't want to be rethinking anything. Um, it's just, I mean, those things are just really well done, and people have put a lot of effort um, into that and a lot of thought, a lot of brain power, a lot of money, and those solutions are really good. When you're dealing with APIs, um, that is the part where you need to rethink a lot of things because, uh, because the way people build applications right now, you know, in 2015, is just so different from the way we were doing it even five or ten years ago. All of that stuff is different. The requirements are different. Um, so rethinking that is really important. Um, and another thing that, and another piece of innovation that happened quite recently is the idea of distributed systems because you can't fit data, you know, on a single machine anymore. You can't meet performance requirements on a single machine anymore. So you have to rethink that part and you have to, you know, build a distributed system, which is really, really hard. So the parts that we've done that I'm really proud of is the distributed system in RethinkDB, you know, I think it's, it's excellent. It's really well designed. It's very safe. It's very, very easy to use. So I'm very happy for that. Uh, Requel, I think, is very well designed, very easy to use, very intuitive to write queries. And the idea of change is the idea of building the whole architecture around push. Um, I think I'm also really proud of because it legitimately, like, makes people's lives a hundred times easier if they're building these kinds of apps. So these are the things we've done differently. And on the storage side, and just kind of traditional database stuff like asset guarantees and all of that, we try to stay as close um, to all the work that people have done you know, in the past probably half a century um, in the database world, because if we think that part doesn't need to be rethought, and it's really, really well done already. What is the business model behind RethinkDB, the company? And is, is there a close analog, maybe Red Hat or Cloudera? And how, how does this affect the developer? Okay, so RethinkDB is open source, and we're open source, you know, both functionally because the code is online, but also in spirit because all of the development happens on GitHub. Um, so anybody could go on GitHub issues, comment on features as they're being designed, and we're collaborating really closely with our developer community. And, like, the user community is absolutely wonderful. It's very vibrant. Uh, we get a lot of feedback. So the whole thing is open source. Um, as far as business model, um, we provide a lot of services to organizations. We provide training both on-site and online to help people bring, re, bring their developers up with RethinkDB and you know, bring them up to speed. We do developer support, so as people build applications, we can help them learn things and get to market faster. We do production support, so if something goes wrong, um, you know, we, we help people out. Generally, we do support over Slack, so they get a real-time channel to our core development team, and, and we can use other, you know, other message systems too. Um, so people really love love the support model. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, we do health checks for people, you know, when they deploy in production, things like that. And we also have a lot of plans for different services on top of everything to be that will make um, people's lives a lot easier. And I can talk about that right now, but hopefully that's going to start coming out, 
you know, next year. So there's a lot of really exciting, exciting stuff we're working on. But right now, um, it, it's been a lot of just basically doing services for people and helping out with getting, you know, getting apps developed, getting into production, and making sure um, everything stays stays great when the once the app um, is up. So you've mentioned a couple resources that aren't quite uh, ready for publication yet. Um, where can people? Where can I put what in the show notes that uh, if people click on these pointers in you know a few months or or three months or five months, these resources will be available. Where should I point people to if they want to find out more about RethinkDB? I would point people to RethinkDB.com. That's the biggest you know biggest repository of information on RethinkDB. And it's it's pretty easy to read. It's well designed. There's a lot of info there. People should should be able to get you know a lot of information. We're also on Twitter, so at rethink you be on Twitter. Uh, we're very active there. We respond um, to most questions. So if users have a question, you can just ping us at rethink you be on Twitter. We'll respond. Um, my personal email address here is slava at rethink you be dot com. So feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. And I'll you know it's it gets sometimes quite hard, but I'll try very hard to respond to every email. Um, so yeah, I'd say use these resources. It's just um, kind of also GitHub. GitHub is another good one. So rethink to be on GitHub is very active and everyone's very responsive. Are there any closing thoughts on rethink DB or application development or computer science that you'd like to uh, provide to my listeners? Yeah, well, we're very excited about what's going on in the web because there's a lot of innovation um, there's a lot of innovation happening in the browser, and this is really important because it's really changing the way the way people build web applications. You know, there's been Angular and Meteor, and React is doing some quite amazing things. And as people build more and more sophisticated uh, front-end applications, it becomes quite clear that the rest of the stack needs to change too because things get very complicated. So that's why we started Rethink to be in, and we're very excited about a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, so that's the first part I wanted to say. The second part is that um, I wanted to thank all of the open source community people that have been engaged with everything to be that have been so helpful, you know, going to hackathons and, and doing tutorials for people, going to meetups, giving feature suggestions, bug reports, um, helping with, um, you know, helping with feature design. Thank you guys so much. The product couldn't, couldn't have been nearly as good as it is now without your help.